not on holiday. No. Well, that's it. Bike uncrated and uh, unpacked from the plane, um, JFK Airport in New York. And yeah, I guess the journey started. Right, cool. Yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, it's a bit cold. You want to see some cool stuff? How would you describe a redneck? <laughs> it's the country hillbilly. Okay, Joe, far away. Okay, you're uh, you're out here uh, in the Chihuahua Desert. Twilight on a paper town, the moon is hanging low, broken silence. When you hear that whistle blow, red light in the sky tonight leads me on to bed. Well, this is Long Beach, California. Quiet, calm, peaceful, genteel. Well, this day has gone to my head. It's away from the hustle and bustle of the highway and the interstate. A wind, which we have a lot of, produces quite a bit of electronic noise. Where the, rain. the static fields are generated from the motion of molecules across the surface. I like living in the desert because I, uh, I don't like a lot of people packed around me all the time and everything else. You know, I like a little elbow room. Well, Hell's Angel could tear that thing down and put it all the way back together in an hour and a half, you know. These guys today, they can't do any of that, you know. But I've got my own can of chili, which I'm going to cook shortly. So I'm camping on the outskirts of Death Valley. By the Apache Indian Road. And then I went also to the, uh, the Borax Works. And there's so many funny little things which, you know, I've never seen before. Nick Sanders says, yeah, go Nick Sanders. That's the Pacific Ocean, and it stretches right out there for a very long way, and Australia and New Zealand, and, <laughs> and that's the only thing separating me from there, and that's where I'm going to end up soon. I hate getting stuck in sand, um, but you know, you could have spotted that. I mean, it was a hill of sand and I rode into it. It's a lesson of fight for a little bloke like me to be able to sort out, so it's good to know that if you get stuck in sand, you can get out of it. Well, I'm in um, midway down Baja, California, and uh, and it's really nice actually. There's not much traffic. I feel as if I'm virtually got the whole peninsula to myself. 
I never get the chance historically to look around. I'm always on a schedule. I'm still able now to slow down, look around, and it's a kind of POV for, for maybe people who just can't get out here. And so I'm sort of, I'm your eyes really. You see this journey th through me, I suppose, um, if you want to. really great. I can't believe it, but the police federal here, I've run, I wasn't running out of petrol, but I was a bit low. And they went out and they went to get some petrol for me and they've really helped out. That's brilliant. Oh, and they're even cleaning my bike. That's absolutely amazing. They are so kind. the El Salvadorian border just across the, the river bridge from Guatemala and it's so tranquil it's unbelievable everybody is so incredibly friendly and tranquilo it's absolutely beautiful I, I can't believe it it's one of the nicest border posts I've ever come across it's really nice it's refreshing to see in fact the whole of Central America has just been absolutely delightful to be perfectly honest it's a very pleasant surprise where you you see parts of the world has actually improved and, and is seriously friendly and cool there we are. Calo Brera is the head of customs um, at the El Salvador Guatemalan border just over the river and it's one of the prettiest most beautiful little frontier posts I've ever had the pleasure to come across. So he's going to tell us um, to hundreds of thousand people or maybe at least or 40 or 50 um, what he thinks about El Salvador. Welcome to El Salvador. It's a nice country. That's great. <laughs> it is a lovely country. Thank you. Marvellous. <laughs> Well, I'm at the Honduran border and it's gone very easily. Bienvenido a Honduras. Bienvenidos a Honduras. Honduras. Bienvenido a Honduras. Um, yep, so we just get on through Honduras and then... Uh, <laughs> Honduras! Firmes y adelante! Then probably crack into... <laughs> to, uh, whatever. My recollections of crossing borders in Central America were much harsher than this. It, it seemed harder then. Show me your money. Show me your money. Let's see your money. Show me your money. Show me your money. Show me your money. money. Yeah. Show me your money. Show me your money. Yeah. 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 Come. So this is the money, yeah? This is the money you make. Show me money. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, look at all that money. There we are. Look at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we are.
in a very quick story is I just got burnt out on the system. The, what everything the world tells you you're supposed to want and strive to get. And I went out and did it out of just spite at a very young age. I was, was angry and just had a hint I've been lied to. And so I, my wife and I decided to move here and we sold everything we had, quit my businesses that were doing really well that I built from nothing and moved to Nicaragua, the second poorest country in our hemisphere. And strictly for one reason, and that's the quality of life. That's why we moved here. And we came here and we found a real community with people our age looking for the same things from all corners of Earth. And, uh, yeah, man, I'm never going back. <laughs> we just had a baby and never been in a better peaceful state of life since moving to Nicaragua. I couldn't leave them behind. You know, they were a part of me. And every single one that I brought, I rebuilt myself and restored. They just meant too much to me. And if I was moving here, they're moving with me. And that was the only option. I had to bring them. I just like the freedom of the road. I like the wind in your hair. I like the ability to just go anywhere and navigate through anything. Sand, rocks, you know, places people can't go. And it's, it's where you used to go on a horse, right? take your horse and go up and down all these places and explore all these roads and now you take your motor horse you know and that's what I really find liberating and free and exciting is about having you know an engine underneath your underneath your butt And I think as a traveller we're allowed our moments of reflection. Life here is not so processed. You know, we live in a processed world where everything is just two or three steps away from really what we understand. And here, walk on the land, they till the land, they grow from the land and they eat from the land. It's, they're so connected to the land, it gives them this wonderful feeling of being connected with the earth. And I know it sounds a little bit alternative, but they're really happy and they think they're living in paradise. What do you like about motorcycling? Well, the story. When I was a kid, about 14 years old, my uncle, he used to re re repair Harley Davidson and I used to help him. And from that time, I got addicted. When you ride a bike, how do you feel? The feelings is great, enjoying the scenery, looking at the nature and the wind in your face, riding in the wind, is something great.
Yesterday's gone like the tide, it's gone like the night The stars in the sky and the sun is here to wash over you To make you brand new, show you how to shine And let's forget the things we can't change The tears and the shame, we've so much to gain If our hearts beat for the here and the now We'll make it somehow, what do you say? Look out at the world, wonder where it goes Feel the wind in your hair, grass in your toes Let go of your cares, only you will know it's sad You're so alone It's an incredible life, there's a lot of advantages You get to see the world, you become a more well-rounded person more educated, more plugged into what's going on in the planet. You meet great people. You learn a lot about motorcycles and travel, but the downside, when you come back, if you're a little bit dislocated, and it's oftentimes very hard to reintegrate into society, oftentimes you come back and you don't have as much resources. You've spent all your money because it can be a very expensive endeavor. Things have changed when you get back, but the really interesting thing that sometimes it's hard for people is the changes that they go through themselves. Well, you just feel very different. Uh, obviously, somebody couldn't expect to feel the same if they've lived their life in a small town, for example, in England, and then they've all of a sudden crossed four or five continents over a span of a couple years and they come back. I wouldn't expect that person to feel the same about anything. Uh, relationships grow distant and estranged. I think that's probably another downside to it. How could anybody realistically expect to maintain a normal relationships with every all of the people around them in their life when they leave? Uh, people that get on with their life and they change and they move and, and uh, uh, the world is evolving constantly. When I was going around the world in an R1 in 19 days, 4 hours, I, I was going so fast and so hard and so furious, I hardly ever saw stuff like this. It was always seeing life from the saddle. And it was the same with the incredible ride. When I went from the length of the Americas, from Ushuaia to, to Prudhoe Bay in 21 days, 8 hours, and the Super Tenere, again, it was hard work all the time. It was very much record-breaking and I never had the opportunity to see places like this. And just look at this, just look at the view. It, it, it's remarkable. From Cuenca, one of the most beautiful cities in Ecuador, and across the mountain pass to the Peruvian border, and through the Cajas National Park, and past the 12,000 foot mountain of Tres Cruces, Ecuador. Stunning, stunning, stunning. And I think this is why it takes me forever to get anywhere, because I meet such amazing characters like that. And I don't want to think it's like I'm being exploitative. You know, he knows I'm taking his photograph and I'm filming him and he loves the idea of showing off his, his you know, his old Chevrolet. 
but he's, he's got such an open heart. It's, there's no cynicism. It's just, yeah, this is part of my life and let's show people what I do. And I think that's really amazing and that makes my day. And this is what this trip is all about. <laughs> oh. Just capturing a few moments, you know, from other people's lives, not just my own, and passing it on. There is a law called Parkinson's law and in terms of space, the more space you've got, the more stuff you want to, to put in it, to, to fill it. And it's the same with time. The more time you've got, um, the more things you want to do and see and, and in my case, ride and, and, and film. And I've got more time than I've ever had before. And, and I'm doing more things than I've ever done before. It's an interesting irony, actually. I don't feel I've got enough time. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of frustrating, which is a very interesting conundrum. I've got to, I really do have to get on to Bolivia. Well, here we are again in one of the most beautiful places in the world, in the southern Peru. Um, I'm, I'm Billy No Mates, me. Um, I haven't got any friends. <laughs> I'm always on my own. I better get back on the bike again. I didn't mean to do any filming today, but I've suddenly rediscovered the, the coastline of southern Peru, and it's without doubt the most beautiful coastline. Um, in the world. Uh, it just makes um, every other coastline inferior by comparison. It's stupendous. I'm so excited. Uh, I filled up my camera all the memory and I'm having to download it on the side of the road into my computer. It's just not what I expected from today. So here's the bike. The, the camera is shielded with my um, t-shirt whilst the computer's you know downloading all my memory from my camera so I can carry on shooting because there's a great shot there which I want to get. And if you walk to the edge of the road here, oh my God, I've I'm, I'm got vertigo, it's not too bad. And I go over to the edge and then you can see what it is. What's special about your uni? A uni has energy. Energy here, like I say, comes from the lithium underneath the solar and the volcanic rocks in the mountains and the minerals and everything. But the beauty of a uni, people come here just for the salt lake, but the mountains are fantastic. The variety of riding here, uh, they're, they're, they're getting away from it. The hot springs, there's hot springs everywhere with thermal energy, you know. It's just a great place to live. The freedom we have here is great, you know. On your motorcycle, away you go, and yeah, nobody says anything. You've got freedom. opening your eyes you know if people can come here and open their eyes be more aware of what's going on around them 
you know and I think motorcycling does that because when you're on a motorcycle you stop thinking about all your problems back at home you're in awe of the Salar the Salar is a great place when you're out there nobody else there just you and me on a motorcycle in 12,000 square kilometers of Salt Lake fantastic place you know This is quite interesting, it's a train cemetery of Uyuni and the town served in the past as a distribution hub for the trains carrying minerals, mostly silver, um, on the way to the Pacific Ocean ports. And the train lines were actually built by British engineers around about 1870. They all came over, built the trains, built the train lines, mostly to transport hundreds of tonnes of silver from Bolivia over to Chile. And at the time, the Brazilian president was the richest man in the world. And it actually created a sizable British community here in, in the town of Uyuni. Well, the train museum was nice, but you can't beat the real thing. I'm back on the road now, and I've, you know, you love that feeling when you're, you're about to start a new ride, and you've checked the bike, it's all okay, and you're all loaded, you're happy, and you're going on a quite a dramatic ride, which is, in this particular instance, across the Andes, which I'm quite excited about. You know, watching someone eat soup isn't very exciting, really. But when you know they've ridden for two and a half months and 16,000 miles all the way across America, Central America and South America to the top of the Andes at 15,000 feet to a place you might consider is in the middle of nowhere. I suppose it's got a slightly different cachet. Ah. Yeah. Bit of llama. I'm right at the top of the Andes, absolutely at the summit, and that was a lucky one. There was a massive thunderstorm just following me, and I thought I was going to get absolutely soaking wet and not be able to do any filming and get the drone out, but I did. Got some nice filming with the bike coming towards camera and so forth, did the business, and now I can go down the other side and descend down the Andes to, um, the, uh, to Aliag and the Chilean Bolivian border. Well, I'm at the Bolivian border now, and that was the fastest um, checkout that I've ever had in the world. It took about 10 seconds. Honestly, it's been brilliant. Bolivia's been brilliant. Viva Bolivia. Fantastic. Now on to Chile. Well, this is my room for the night, a little dormitory room in uh, Oliagüe, which is lovely. It's very basic, but it's fine. It's a roof over my head. I'm knackered. Sometimes you've just got to stop and, and just look around at this beautiful world. We're so lucky as motorcyclists because we can explore it as travellers in such a different way. We can stop wherever we want and just have a look around. A day in the life of riding a Yamaha Tenere 700. Or is it a life in the day because you're packing so much riding this beautiful bike? I'm still on the Alto Plano. We live in such a beautiful place. I mean, you don't have to go as far as Chile in the Andes to, to explore this great beauty. This used to be a much quieter crossing of the Andes. And they're actually building a road, so before long, there'll be a proper tarmac road all the way from Bolivia into northern Chile. But it just goes to prove that the world actually is being paved. I've been up to four and a half thousand metres. 
and I was riding out of Chile, which was extraordinary riding once again. You can do it in where you live, in very local to where you ride. You think you had the best riding day of your life, and then you have another riding day, which is even better. Be aware that you've got to look around and breathe in the air and smell the coffee. And, and then the next day, I find a bloke, or he finds me. I'm just standing on the side of the road next to me bike, just having a think. And he's on a Tenere 700 as well, and he knows me. So guess what? Uh, it makes me a coffee. And so that evening I found somewhere to camp slightly out of the way and it was really nice but it took me ages to cook my tea because I couldn't find any firewood. What do you think about South America as a motorbiking destination? There are so many things to see in South America, so many different countries, different cultures. You go from Bolivia to Argentina and it's a completely different world uh, in terms of culture. Landscape is also different. There are many things to experience. I mean, You know that person that stands in the doorway at a party and doesn't seem to move? Well, the geeks will rule the world because he's rather clever. Because um, the whole party has to pass through that doorway in order to get to where it needs to get to and he doesn't have to move. There are not many places in the world where you have the opportunity to ride a bike to 4,900 metres above sea level, maybe in the Himalayas. But in order to do that, you have to ride for days and days and days in the middle of nowhere. Oshawa is a little bit like that because it's the most southernmost city in the world. Here in South America, you can ride from sea level to 5,000 meters in two hours. And then you go down the Andes to the other side. It's at the very southern tip of the Americas. And any motorcyclist who aims to ride the Americas from coming south from New York will need to get there. The Andes is the longest mountain range in the world. They, they go from Antarctic continent all the way up to Alaska. So imagine how many mountain crosses or mountain passes you can do only in Argentina and, and Bolivia, for example. It's, it's great. Oshawaya doesn't have to move because the party comes to it. And it's really rather wonderful. And it's far away from anywhere. And it's definitely worth getting to when you get to it. And it's safe. Today people will pay a lot of attention to that, which is fine. It's a very safe place to stay. Either country in South America, it's safe. If you know where to stay with a bike, there's absolutely no problem, no problem at all.